1 Peter 3, 21, the like figure wherein to even baptism doth also now save us, not, and, and this is very important in what I'm going to show you tonight. Does, again, does water baptism save you? No, it does not. Water baptism does not save the soul because the soul was never touched with the water. It does not save the soul. It purifies the flesh, but it doesn't save the soul. So, but he, and he says the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is on the right hand of God. Where is he? Has he ever left? No, he hasn't. Not since going there. He's never left. That's why he sent his spirit down. His spirit is here. The spirit of his son is in us crying out the Father. But Jesus is mediating at the right hand of the Father. And then, and this is probably what we'll look into next time, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Do devils do what Jesus tells them to do? Do they always do what God tells them to do? That's going to be the question for next week. So um, let's see where we're going with it. Oh, yeah, here we go. I'm going to put that up on the screen. And uh, we, when I started going through this idea of a mediator, I used this at the beginning because we were talking about how Christ then is our mediator that when we pray, since we are unclean and cannot be in the presence of holy God, then we go to God by way of the Holy Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was us and was God. And so we can carry God, we can pray our prayers as tattered as they are. We can pray our prayers to Jesus. The Holy Ghost also helps us in those prayers and God will answer our prayers. Amen. 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 I, and I believe that. I feel better. Amen. But how does that work then? We know this how it works when we've got something to say to God. It goes through Christ. Not the bishop. Not the pope. Not, not even Mary herself, much less a statue of Mary. And a statue of some guy with a beard and a dress on. Okay, that is not, it's not Jesus. It pretends to be, but it's not Jesus. So we know that they do not speak for us. Amen. Christ does. Yeah. So the other way around. When God has something to say to mankind, we've already found out that the voice of God Almighty, the Father God on His throne, terrorizes and potentially slays mankind. Mankind is not able to bear the voice of God. Amen? Amen. Well, I got something in my mind that just popped in there. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's good to be in your house tonight. Father, we thank you for this cool down in our weather. And Lord, we thank you for fall colors. We thank you, Lord, for these leaves turning colors. And Lord, we just, we, I love changing of the seasons. God, it just bears witness to you. And so, Father, I thank you for it. And thank you, Lord, for healing us. Thank you for helping us. Lord, in giving us comfort and grace. And for being our God, for being our Father. Lord, we thank you for that. And Father, I pray, God, that you'd bless each and every one here tonight. Bless each and every one watching online. Be with those, Father, that tonight could not come out tonight. That maybe some in the hospital. Maybe some that are just at home and cannot make it out. God, I pray that you would be with them. Father, let them know that they're not alone. Don't let them be alone tonight. And Father, that you would guide all of us as we study your word. And we thank you for Jesus, our mediator, who not only speaks for us, but Father, we learn tonight that He speaks for you. And so Lord, teach us these things and manifest, Lord, your presence in the form of your word and your spirit, which guides us in your word. Father, hear the prayers tonight of those, Lord, who are maybe those who are still sick, those who are hurting in some way, 
those who are struggling in some way with some issue of life. And Lord, I already know today, Lord, by way of the phone calls that have been made, Lord, there's issues in some people's marriages. God, I pray that you would help them, help them abundantly. Help them, Father, get sorted out. Bless husbands, bless wives, Father. Bless even, Lord, those that their homes, Lord, are divided because of religion. God, you're able to save people that are lost, and you're able to save lost husbands because of the wives. You're able to save lost wives because of a believing husband. And Father, we just pray, God, that you would just bless, Lord, the people that have cried out to you today that needed help. Lord, just bless and honor your word tonight, and bless our prayer time, Father, as we draw close to you. We pray this in Jesus' name, and our Lord and Savior and all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. So, the issue is, can any of these mediate up between us and God? And I had this, I had this thing pop in my head, turn back to Exodus 19, just very quickly, Exodus 19, Exodus 20. And, um, and remember then how God spoke, when God spoke. And remember this, God is the same yesterday, today, forever. So here is God, he's speaking. And when God speaks, the presence of God on top of Mount Sinai, the earth regarded the presence of Almighty God. Did it not? It shook. The mountain lit on fire, there were thunderings and lightnings, and the voice of a trumpet exceeding loud, the Bible says. And God, in chapter 20, God spake all these words, saying, and if you let that sink in, God was on top of Mount Sinai, the people were at the base of Mount Sinai, and God began to speak to those people from the top of that mountain, and as He's doing that, He's given them his law, his terrible law. Not terrible in that I hate it, but it brought terror to those people. So that you read in verse 18, And all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of the trumpet and the mountain smoking. When the people saw it, they removed and stood afar off. And they said, Moses, speak thou with us and we will hear. But let not God speak with us, lest we die. Now, several years ago, I was introduced to a form of prayer that is passing through a lot of what you would call evangelical churches and even maybe in some what maybe would be called fundamental churches. Churches, I would say, whose people would know better, but a form of prayer, it goes by different names, the Jesus Prayer. The Whisper Prayer, Lectio Divina, uh, Ignatian Contemplation, named after Ignatius de Loyola, founder of the Jesuit, okay? Named after many names. And what it is, is it's not a spoken prayer. Those two words are contradictory. An unspoken prayer, even... When we pray in our hearts, are not words going to our mind that we're directing to God, right? I mean, there's words here. We don't just mm, to God and God does that back. But in this case, they say God speaks. If he speaks at all, God speaks Yeah, that's my point. You poor people with hearing aids, you'd be going, What, God? Say, say that again. And of course, the whole purpose is, is trying to make you still and empty your mind and make your brain a vacuum. And you're going, Hey, what did you say? That, and there's only one place in the whole Bible that I can see somebody talking in a whisper. Who was it? It was a familiar spirit. It was a familiar, a devil. A, a mask, a spirit pretending to be God or something else. 
God never, and you say, well, you, well, he speaks in a still small voice. That's a voice. There's a difference. A whisper is words without a voice. It's just with the mouth. Whisper. It's breath. Am I making too much out of this? I don't think so because these people are saying that God is speaking directly to them. And my case is that if we're going to believe the Bible, if God Almighty is speaking to these people, they'll die. And they wouldn't be boasting about how God spoke to them. To me, it, it's obviously not God's voice. And if it's not God's voice, then what voice is it? That's the question that you're left with, that it must be a spirit pretending to be God. And a lot of this comes out of the Catholic Church. A lot of it, it comes out of uh, Eastern mysticism. Uh, think practices like yoga, which you ought not do. Why? Why not? Why can't we do yoga? Why can't we stretch? Stretch. There's nothing wrong with stretching. If you're going to run, stretch. If you're going to split wood, stretch a little bit. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> noises. You make noises when you do that. But... Stretching is one thing. Altering your mind, going into a hypnotic trance, and because the word yoga means yoke. It means connected. And the idea is you're connected to one of their gods, one of their 330 million gods. Okay? And so, yeah, that's why you ought not do that. But anyway, is it possible that the holy, mighty God, the most high God, speaks to man with his own voice. And the answer is, we see it as no, because man cannot withstand it. Therefore, God must pick a mediator to speak for him. Uh, let's go to Hebrews 1. Hebrews 1. Verse 1. God. And here it is to me. Plainest day in your Bible. God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers. How? By the prophets. That was God's choice. God is the one knowing that creation cannot withstand his voice, man cannot withstand his voice, that God chose then to speak to prophets, men of God, holy men of God, and they spake as God put the words in their mouth, but God, the Holy Ghost, had them write out the words or speak the words, and it was done by way of the Holy Ghost, God speaking in time past under the, by the prophets, verse 2, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. So what you're seeing in these two verses, the establishment of the mediator, whereby in one way, they, the mediator speaks for us, but in this way now, the mediator speaks to us for God. In the Old Testament, it was done by way of Moses and the prophets. But in these last days, it is done to us by way of His Son. His Son is the vocal mediator between God and mankind. If you want to hear from God, you will hear it through Jesus Christ. Amen? You will, and you will not, you will not hear it through statue. Statues do not talk. Amen? You'll not hear it through another man. You'll not hear it through a bishop. You'll not hear it through a church. That is not how God designed it. God designed it to be speaking His Word through, or speaking to us His Word through the Word, Jesus Christ. Now, a couple months ago, and what kind of put this fresh in my mind, I was over talking to Dee today. She had just come out of surgery and I walked in the room, sat down, and she immediately started telling me. She said, I was going through her, she said, I was going through my mother's Bible. And her mother was a Roman Catholic. And she said, this Bible was printed back in the 50s. And she said, it had a lot of stuff in it. And she said, I'm reading it. I'm, and she said, I'm just going, 
I can't believe people believe this. There was a section in that Bible, Joe, about the mass, the ceremony of the mass. And it said, and I'm going to, I'm going to put you on the spot tonight because I'm going to make you tell me a verse that contradicts this. It literally said that the priest is given the power by God when he performs the mass to physically bring down Jesus from heaven to that Catholic church to be held in his hand as the wafer. He physically has, he says the hocus pocus that brings Jesus literally down from heaven bodily to appear physically in that church in the form of the communion mass wafer, the Eucharist. Now, put you on the spot. Give me a verse. Yes, Jared. That's pretty good. I don't have a problem with that one. I'll give you 75% for that one. That's pretty good. 80, I'll give you 90%. How's that? Did you hear about the teacher that refused to give students in her class who, were, who did not turn in their assignment. She was told that for doing nothing, they had to get 50%. And fired her because she refused. She gave them a zero. Absolutely good. Gave them a zero for not turning in the work. And they fired her. That's stupid. Amen. There, I, will, I won't get off on that tonight. I already did, but I won't go farther. Okay. So give me another one. So you get a 90% on that one. It wasn't the exact verse I was thinking of, but I like it. You can come up with another one if you want. You can use your phone. You can phone a friend, okay? You can do this, you know. That's what I did. When Dee was telling me this, I went. There was a verse in my mind, and I could practically see it in the page of my Bible. That's, you get used to your own Bible. It's got all your marks in it, and you can almost see the verse on the, where it is on the page. In Romans... No, it was Romans 10. So I had to look it up on my phone. But in Romans 10, verse 6. But the righteousness which is of faith speak of those on this wise. Say not in thine heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Oh, now you're saying, I got it. <laughs> Deacons are all alike, I tell you what. But I mean, this one verse smashes that whole doctrine. Now, so I told Dee, I said, when you get to feeling better, I want snaps of that, of that article in that Catholic Bible because I'm going to use it. Okay? So that got me thinking about how, and I won't just limit this to the Catholic Church, how the Catholic Church and a growing amount of evangelical churches have transitioned away from or are in the process of transitioning away from Regarding the pages, the 1189 chapters of the Bible, how they are no longer regarding this as final authority. Saying, God is not confined to the Bible. God is not bound to the Bible. God is bigger than our Bibles. Okay, A growing number of evangelists. And it takes a renegade like Andy Stanley, who I was talking about yesterday. It takes these renegades... To push it out there first. But now that it's out there. Others join in on it. Soften it a little bit. To get people to accept it. But before long now that's the new paradigm. That God doesn't speak to the Bible anymore. So. I have. A copy. Of the Catholic Catechism. And it's a book that teaches American Catholics. The Catholic Catechism. And it has in this book the official dogma of the Vatican. 
This is what they, this is not some, I didn't get this off the internet. Okay, because I, I wouldn't trust it. If I saw something on the internet, I would want to know, I want to see the source of it. I want to see where it came from. Well, I have the book. It was printed for American Catholics or Catholic wannabes and teaching them the Catholic catechism. The Catholic Church has an entity or this thing called the magisterium. Have you ever heard of that? The magisterium. Okay. The word, the magis part, it's where we get the word magi from. Some say that they were magicians, but the word magis itself means teacher. It's a Latin word meaning teacher. Okay. A magistrate. Okay. Someone who enforces laws or codes or different things like that. But the magisterium is the teaching entity of the Catholic Church. And here's what it says. The popes and bishops in union with him, the Pope, are successors of the apostles and inherit the responsibility of authoritative teaching from them. So what they're saying is, the Pope and the bishops are final authority because they derive their authority from the original apostles. And it's been passed down through the line. Dee told me that, you know, she used to hear Catholic women say, well, you know, the first pope was Peter. Peter was the Catholic church started before all the other churches. And all the other churches broke off from the Catholic church. And Peter was the first pope. Everybody knows that. She, these people would be amazed to find out that that's not in the Bible anywhere. Not even in history. It's not even a historical fact that Peter was the first pope of a Catholic church. Never happened. This didn't show up until A.D. 300 with Constantine, who said that he saw a sign in the heavens that said, in this sign, conquer. And he believed that it was a cross and that God was giving him the unction to conquer the world for the cross. And he was a pagan five minutes before that and five minutes after that. Now he's the pope of the church. That's how that happened. Okay. So, but here's what they said. We call this teaching office the magisterium. The task of giving an authentic interpretation of the word of God, whether it, listen to this, whether in its written form or in the form of tradition. Do you see what they said? They called the tradition of the Catholic church the word of God. Shake your heads. But this is what, this is what they teach. This is what they stand on. This is what they believe. Those pedophiles and adulterers and fornicators and drunkards who call themselves priests of the Catholic Church, they are the only ones, according to the magisterium, who have the right to interpret the Bible. And this interpretive arm of the Catholic Church is called the Word of God. No. This. This. Now, then they say... Tradition, and they mean Catholic tradition. Whatever the Pope said 1,500 years ago, 1,000 years ago, 500 years ago, or 100 years ago, or yesterday, whatever the Pope said is the tradition. Tradition is the living transmission of the message of the gospel in the church. The oral preaching of the... Watch this. Watch how they set this up, Brother George. The oral preaching of the apostles... And the written message of salvation under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, in other words, the Bible, are conserved and handed on as the deposit of faith through the apostolic succession in the church. So they say, here are the popes down through the centuries. And oh, by the way, here's the Bible. And it's the popes who are the authority over the Bible. They determine what the Bible says and what the Bible doesn't say by way of interpreting what they want you to think it says. Uh, both the living tradition and the written scriptures have their common source in the revelation of God in Jesus Christ. Now, here's what they said. When interpreting scripture, we should be attentive to what God wanted to reveal through the authors for our salvation. We need to see scripture as a unified whole with Jesus Christ at the center. 
We must also read scripture with the living tradition of the whole church so that we may come to grasp a true interpretation of the scriptures, which is the opposite of what we believe because we believe that we read the Holy Scriptures only. And only the Scriptures can interpret the Scriptures. But according to them, the magisterium interprets the Scriptures. And you in the pew have no right to interpret or you're not allowed to think what this verse might mean on your own. You must get it from the church. Or you're not a good Catholic. Guilty. Um, the task of giving an authoritative interpretation of the word of God has been entrusted to the magisterium. Okay, here's my question. By who? The authority of the interpretation of the word of God has been entrusted to the magisterium. Who entrusted that? Who gave the magisterium? Do you understand what the magisterium is? The magisterium is the Pope and his bishops down through the centuries. And whatever the Pope said. The Pope said, the Pope said that praying to Mary was essential. Then that's what you have to believe. Now, where's that in the Bible? Nowhere. But that's the point. They have derived from certain essences of the scripture that Mary acts as a mediator between man and Jesus Christ, even though the Bible doesn't say that. So herein lies the ability of the Church of Rome to establish the word of God for your salvation, even though the Bible doesn't say it. Because they said it, it's as much or more an authority, and you must believe it, or you're not going to go to heaven. Okay? Uh, so it's been entrusted to the magisterium. And my question is, who gave the magisterium that authority? They took it on themselves. So let God be true and also the popes, according to the Catholic Church. That's what they're saying. So, in, here's on page 28. Interpretation of scripture is ultimately subject to the judgment of the magisterium. Plain words. No misunderstanding that. Interpretation of scripture is not ever allowed by anybody except the magisterium of the Catholic Church. So if they say Jesus was pink and purple, then Jesus was pink and purple. And if you don't believe that, you're going to hell. So do we believe do you believe, because I do, do you believe that at some point Rome is going to say, the Vatican is going to say, we now are convinced that Mary is co-redeemer with Jesus Christ, a fourth part of the Godhead, and salvation must be by Mary. Do you believe that they'll come out with that? John Paul John Paul pushed it big because John Paul II, when he was shot, he believed that it was the Virgin Mary that saved his life and kept him from dying that day. And he worshipped her to the day he died. Because he really believed it was Mary that kept him alive. He, he was ready to promote that. I'm not sure where this liberal pope stands. Ratzinger, I don't think, would have ever touched it. So I don't know where Pope Francis stands on this. But I know that there is a movement in the Vatican to make Mary officially co-redemptrix. Fourth part of the Godhead. Okay? And Mary, in their, in their words, is nothing more than Mystery Babylon the Great, the Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. The book says in the United States, a certain number of Christians of many denominations, often called fundamentalist. I'll take that one. Have adopted the supremacy of scripture as their sole foundation. Yeah. Amen. Why? Why not? 
All Scripture is given by inspiration of God, is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished into all good works. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Amen. Amen. So why not? So the fundamentalists have adopted the supremacy of Scripture as their sole foundation. They also approach Scripture from the viewpoint of private interpretation. Now they're lying. They're lying. Because a true Bible believer will know that he can never privately interpret Scripture. He must do it through the Bible, and the Bible will interpret Scripture. That's what we believe. So, do you think they just don't understand how we believe, or do you think they deliberately misled? Oh, there's no doubt. Deliberately. They didn't call me and ask me, what do fundamentalists believe, Pastor Mike? I would have told them. They didn't call me. So, they, uh, uh, private interpretation. This they do in the strictest literal sense without appreciation of the various literary forms that the biblical authors use within the specific cultural circumstances in which they were writing. Now, let me ask you a question. As you're reading the scripture, did you run across the part where the Bible said, now, this only means what it meant 2,000 years ago. Did you ever read that in there? Did you ever read some sort of guide in the Bible that told you that you had to see it the way the Jews saw it 3,000 years ago? You had to say it in Hebrew. You had to do it this. We don't believe that. And that's not there. So what they're doing is, they're, I believe in the literalness. I believe John saw a beast with seven heads. And I believe the beast has seven heads. I believe he has ten horns. And I believe he has ten horns, ten crowns on those ten horns. That's what I believe. And there's no mistaking that. I believe Jesus was in the grave three days. I believe uh, Naaman had to dip in the water seven times. I believe the floods came up 40 days and 40 nights. I believe the waters prevailed 150 days. I believe all that stuff in the Bible. Literal interpretation of Scripture. Why not? Does God have a speech problem? Did God say that he spoke? Well, he did say he spoke in parables, but he always gave the meaning of those parables. Always. He never left anything unhidden. So, uh, they accuse us of believing it in the strictest literal sense, and they're saying that you can't do that. So, the church's response to fundamentalism is that revelation is transmitted by apostolic tradition and scripture together. Together. The Bible, but the popes over the Bible. And if the Bible literally disagreed with the popes, the popes have the authority to say, it says that, but it doesn't mean that. That's how they got Brady Crumb. When Brady was a Jehovah's Witness, they convinced him, but it didn't last long because he always felt that the Bible just meant what it said. But the whole Jehovah's Witness point is every time you see hell, it doesn't really mean that burning place on fire. It means something. Even though it says it, it doesn't mean that. And I've had Jehovah's Witness at my door having a conversation with them about hell. And they gave me this yarn about, well, you know, God was, Jesus was speaking parables and those were made up stories and on and on. In other words, it said hell, but it didn't mean hell. It said fire, but it didn't mean fire. It said that he was awake and conscious and wanting water, but he didn't really want that. That's not really how it happened. That's how they explain away what the Bible says. So this is the Catholic Church approach. The church and apostolic tradition exist. Watch this. Here's how they set this up. The church and apostolic tradition existed before the written New Testament. They're saying that because the apostles were around... Before any one of them started writing the word of God. Therefore, that means that the apostolic tradition is always first over the written word of God. Now, they said New Testament, but what about Old Testament? It had been around for at least 400 years before the New Testament was ever written. Okay, but anyway, 
Uh, the church and apostolic tradition existed before the written New Testament. Her apostles preached the gospel orally before writing it down. The apostles appointed bishops to succeed them with the authority to continue their teaching. Scripture, listen to this. Scripture alone is insufficient. What a shame. What a shame. And Dee and I were talking about, she was wondering about all the people that have been misled and they, they sincerely believe that whatever the bishop told them was true. And I raised the question, is it just simple ignorance or is it willful ignorance? You understand the difference? Simple ignorance means that's all they were ever taught and they never heard anything different. That's simple ignorance. Willful ignorance is they were taught the truth, but they deliberately ignored it and kept on believing what the Catholic Church told them. Now, the sad thing of it is both either way, they're going to hell. Roman Catholics should not be hated. They should be loved. Loved enough to want them to be converted to only the Scriptures and know it for salvation. Okay? Not, we don't hate them. I'm not preaching hate, not teaching hate, not talking hate. Except for maybe the popes and the bishops and the, the willful ignorant people. But when it comes to the Roman Catholic people, love them. Pray for them. They are a mission field. Okay, how many Roman Catholics are there in the United States of America? A million? Millions, okay? That's how many. There's a billion Roman Catholics or more all over the world. Maybe two billion. That's how many of them we should love enough. So we have a radio station in a Catholic-dominated area of Kenya. And those priests don't like me. I don't care. I'm hoping one of them gets saved. I do. I, w I would love for God to save a Roman Catholic priest and me not know anything about it until years later. That way I can't take the credit for it. Okay? But I would love for God to do that. And I'd love for that man to come out and pull out Roman Catholics out of that wicked church and then be hated by the Roman Catholic Church and they might even try to kill him. It's been done. Amen? Let me finish this up. But that's what, that's what it got me. Scripture alone is insufficient. Authoritative teaching is also needed. That is given to us by the church's teaching office. Not by the Holy Ghost, by the way. Not by the Holy Ghost. You can't read the Bible and the Holy Ghost speak to you and tell you what that means. You're not allowed to do that. Only the Pope's. And the cardinals and the bishops can, they are the only ones who get that Holy Ghost. Okay? Um, Catholics then accept scripture and tradition as, quote, one sacred deposit of the Word of God. Although this sets us apart from those who believe only in the Bible as their source of revelation, from those who believe only in the Bible, I already read that part, didn't I? Catholics accept and honor both scripture and tradition with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. The church also recognizes that she has a unique relationship to Muslims. I'm still reading from their book. They wrote this. Listen to this. The, this is from the Catechism. The plan of salvation also includes those who acknowledge the Creator in the first place amongst whom are the Muslim. Those profess to hold the faith of Abraham and together with us they adore the one merciful God, mankind's judge, on the last day. That is heresy. There's your sign of apostasy right there. If you're not following anything else, that is apostate right there. The church engages in dialogue not only with Muslims, but also Hindus and Buddhists. Quote, she has a high regard for the manner of... Notice they call her she. Mystery Babylon the Great. She has a high regard for the manner of life and conduct, the precepts and doctrines which, although differing in many ways from her own teaching, nevertheless often reflect a ray of that truth which enlightens all men. 
These dialogues are conducted on the local level and also on the international level through the Pontifical Council for the Interreligious Dialogue. That's page 131. If you want to look it up yourself, I'm not lying to you. They are. But what they're saying is we accept Muslims, we accept Buddhists, we accept Hindus. Huh? Bees come out from among her and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. And I will receive you. But if you're mixed up in that unclean thing, God will not accept you. Even Rahab knew she had to get out of Jericho. Amen? So, I believe that only my Bible is the, this is the mediator of God's word to me through his son in the form of this book right here. And I know y'all believe that, but I'm, I'm saying it, saying what you believe, only the Bible. Till death do us part, amen? And even death won't part us. I'll just have it written in my heart. Yes, Brother George. Sure they did. Sure they did. They dropped the second commandment out of the catechism. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven images. They took that completely out. And they took the tenth commandment and split it in half. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. That's number nine. Number ten. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. So they still got ten. The numbers match. Just the words are mixed up. They forgot one verse of the song. The one verse that they're guilty of in every church that they have. Amen. Who knows somebody that's a Roman Catholic tonight? Okay. You have mothers and fathers. You have brothers and sisters. You have... Um, there are people, and I'm not going to say names, but there are people watching me on a regular basis. I don't know about now, but they're watching me on a regular basis that the Catholic Church has a hook in them. And I've been praying and trying to work with this person to get him to unhook. Because I told him, those priests are lying through their teeth to you. And I, was showing, and I showed him the Bible. And he went, oh, wow. And I said, what are you going to do about that? Man, I don't know. Pray for him. Pray for him. That's the catechism. That's the. That, it says that, that it's in line with the Bible and men's traditions, but everything that that catechism says is the exact opposite of what the Bible says. Bada boom, bada bing. You get it. You get it. So that ups your grade to 100% now. Okay? You just, you just got extra credit. Okay? That you get it. That's, that was my point. That they defiantly contradict precisely to the letter what the Bible says by their tradition and by their voice saying this is what it really this is how God really believes and you must accept us being over the Bible or you can't go to heaven Mary will not send you to heaven okay that's it you got it in a nutshell so we don't just have a billion Roman Catholics against us because right here you can plainly see I listen I guarantee you that behind the scenes you've got Catholic priests and Muslim imams of high rank always working together behind the scenes always to destroy two groups of people Bible believing Christians and guess who else Jews Jews okay Prayer requests. Pray for Roman Catholics. Pray for Catholic people that you know. Pray for, and, and I'm collecting all these things. At some point, I'm going to make a video called Why I Am Not a Roman Catholic. And I'm going to present their doctrine versus what the Bible says so that people will then, they'll just have to make a choice. Who am I going to believe? But at least the seed of the Word of God is going to go into them. So maybe, it, hopefully, it'll save somebody. Who's. Colossians 2 8. That's. Where is it? Colossians 2 8. What does it say? 
Yeah. It says, close your Bible at the end of church. Colossians 2, 8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit. After the tradition of men. See it? Word for word tradition of men. Word for word they violate scripture. After the rudiments of the world and not after Christ. Rudiments of the world means that in order to be saved right, you have to go into their church and stand literally on this spot on the carpet. Because it's called the transept, the nave. It's where the cross points meet. And you receive the Eucharist here. And they put the dead body right here. And the married couple are joined together right here on this exact spot on the carpet. And it can't be over here and it can't be over here. I just want to annoy them and say, I'm going to stand right over here, caddy-wise, and I'm just going to pray to God. Amen?